We have now started the Lenten journey, and Lent is the 40-day period leading up to Easter. It's uh, reminiscent of the time that Jesus spent alone in the wilderness where he fasted and, and prayed for 40 days. Uh, some of you are familiar with Lent, others of you may not be, depending upon the tradition from which you come, but I believe that Lent is a time of self-reflection. Um, a time of introspection, a time for us to look uh, into our own soul and to try uh, to grow spiritually. Um, one of the guiding scriptures that I use for the Lenten season is a question that Jesus asked in the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but fail to recognize the log in your own eye? First take the speck or the log out of your own eye and then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. I. Lynn is a time for us to work on our own spiritual journeys, to uh, identify shortcomings or character flaws that we have uh, that we need to, uh, to uh, work on and, and, and try to correct. Uh, we are starting a brand new series called Unafraid, and uh, this is the first message of that series, and it will run all the way through uh, the Lenten season. Um, back in December, I was walking through Parnassus Bookstore, which is my favorite bookstore here in Green Hills, and uh, there was a book that caught my eye. It was a bright yellow book with the title Unafraid on it. And um, I went and picked it up, and it was a book written by a guy named Benjamin Corley. And Corley is a popular blogger on the Patheos website, um, but he grew up in a very conservative um, hellfire and brimstone tradition uh, of the faith and um, at some point in his life he had what he calls a, a midlife spiritual reawakening and uh, he started asking himself why would God seek to punish and torture his creation? Why are so many Christians taught that we are undeserving, inadequate, and damned? Uh, it no longer made sense in his mind and he was over it, and according to a lot of the research that's out there today, there are many other people who feel the same way as Corley. They do not want to worship a judgmental God who has it out for his people because it simply does not square with the message of Jesus Christ. So Corley finally decided that we can hold a fear-based foundational understanding of God or a love-based understanding of God, but we simply cannot hold both because love doesn't fear and fear doesn't love. Now for those who are hardcore biblical literalists, there is scripture to back up this claim. In the book of 1 John chapter 4, the author says, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God and whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. And then the passage continues, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Now, I don't know about you, but I grow weary of living in a culture that is dominated by fear. I grow weary of turning on the news and just like this past week, finding out that 17 teenagers are dead because of another school shooting. I grow weary of politicians of either party using fear as a way to control and coerce their people. And, and I just get tired of, of, of living in a society that is, uh, that is haunted by fear, where people expect the worst and they always think that something terrible is about to happen. At the end of the first chapter of his book, Corley says this, I woke up one morning and I decided that I wanted to know what my life and my faith might look like if I chose to be unafraid. So I took a, a good, hard look at my fear, and I decided to un-it, so that I could in turn help you do the same. And that's going to be the focus of this sermon series, is how can we get to a place where we don't live in fear all the time, where we don't worry all the time, where we don't let uh, that uh, kind of thinking uh, consume us and control us. What would our lives look like if we got to a place where we were sick and tired of being afraid. And we made the decision to not be afraid anymore. 
What if we woke up one day and said, I, I'm sick and tired of fear dominating my life. I'm sick and tired of worrying about everything that might or could happen. I'm sick and tired of ruining the present because I'm so distracted by my fear that I cannot even focus on the present moment. What would that look like? I think it might look like living a life of faith. I think it might look like living the life that Jesus Christ taught us and calls us to live. Henry Nouwen, who was a great spiritual thinker, put it this way in his book, Spiritual Formation. He says, the more people I come to know and the more I come to know people, the more I am overwhelmed by the negative power of fear. It often seems that fear has invaded every part of our lives that we no longer know what a life without fear is like. Fear pervades our bodies individually and communally. So many people let their thinking, their speaking and acting be motivated by fear. We fear for ourselves and fear for our neighbors. We fear that something terrible may happen. But the truth is when fear takes over, we don't have any quality of life. When fear takes over, we cannot enjoy the present. When fear takes over, it affects our health and our relationships and our interaction with each other. When fear takes over, faith gets pushed out. And so I'd like to propose something as we begin this Lenten season this year, and it's this. Jesus Christ lived a fearless life. How do I know that? I know that because I have read and studied the Gospels. I know that because of the things that Jesus said and did. Now, I can't say that there was never a time in Jesus's life when he wasn't afraid. But when we study the Gospels and we study uh, the, the records that we have of Jesus's life, it should become very clear that Jesus was always confronting fear. Think about this. When he went to the wilderness uh, to be by himself and, and to pray, and he was tempted. He looked the devil in the eye and he said no three times. When it came time to recruit the disciples, he didn't hesitate. He said, come and follow me and I'll make you fish for people. And they stopped what they were doing and they came and they followed him. When he gave his most famous sermon by the Sea of Galilee, he said this about worry. He said, do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying at a single hour to your span of life? When he and the disciples were on the boat and they were crossing the Sea of Galilee and a huge storm came up, the disciples were terrified and they, they thought that they were going to die and they went down to wake Jesus up and they said, we're going to perish. And Jesus was asleep and he woke up and he said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And he stood up and he rebuked the winds and the waves and there was a dead calm. One day when he was teaching on a hillside, Outside of town, there was an incredible crowd that followed him. The Bible said that it was 5,000 people, maybe even more. And the disciples said, Lord, it's getting late. Let's let these people go back into the village so that they can get their uh, something to eat. And you know what Jesus said? He said, no, you give them something to eat. And with that, he took two fish, and five loaves of bread, and he blessed it, and he told them to distribute it and there was plenty to go around, even with leftovers. Now, one day Jesus had gone up to the mountain to pray alone. He told the disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side of the lake. And uh, again, the boat is away from the land and a huge storm comes up. The boat's being battered by waves. And early in the morning, Jesus comes walking on the water. And again, the disciples are terrified. It seems like the disciples are always terrified. They're always afraid. But Jesus says, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And then he commands Peter to come and walk on the water. And Peter does walk on the water and he only starts to sink when he takes his eyes off Jesus. Now that's a sermon in and of itself. One day a really rich guy comes up to Jesus and he says, teacher, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? 
And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, yes, Jesus, I've kept all of those ever since my youth. But what do I still lack? And Jesus felt bad for the guy. Jesus had pity on the guy. And he said, well, you lack one thing. Go and sell everything that you own and give the money to the poor and then come and follow me. Then you'll have treasure in in heaven. And we know what happened. The, The guy went away sad because he could not imagine his life without all of this stuff, without all of his money. It defined him. It's how he was known. He couldn't begin to think of life apart from all of his things. Think about the courage that Jesus showed when he rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, uh, the beginning of Holy Week. The crowd waved palm branches and shouted Hosanna, and the Romans were looking on, and and the, the Jews were cheering. But Jesus entered Jerusalem with incredible courage, knowing what was coming in the days ahead. He was betrayed and arrested, and he's brought before the high priest Caiaphas, and he was asked, Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus responds by saying, You have said it so. He's brought before Pilate, and he's asked again, Are you the king of the Jews? And what does he say? Jesus says, You say so. He's mocked. He's beaten. And he's forced to carry his cross. And he does it, and then he's nailed to a cross, perhaps the most brutal form of execution back in that day, but he keeps his courage the entire time because he knew that God would have the final word. I would propose to you as we begin this Lenten season that if we are to be true followers of Christ, then we must face our fears. We too must show courage when dealing with the things that we would rather not deal with including facing death itself. My friend and a mentor of mine named Fred Craddock passed away uh, about three years ago, once preached a sermon uh, where he talked about fear. And Fred was an amazing storyteller and he just had a way with with words. Uh, But he said this, he said, the opposite of faith is fear and fear is death itself. He said, why don't you go out for the ball team? Fred, I won't make it. Why don't you try out for the play school? Afraid I won't get the part? Why don't you, why'd you lie to your parents? Afraid of getting punished? Why'd you cheat on the test? I was afraid I'd fail. Why were you so jealous? I was afraid of losing love. And to that list, we could add, why do you stick with that job that you hate? Afraid I can't get another one? Why do you think about money all the time? I'm afraid I'll run out. Why do you keep buying new clothes? I'm afraid I won't be in style. Why do you stay in that abusive relationship? I'm afraid of being alone. Why don't you go to counseling? I'm afraid I'll have to confront my issues. Why don't you join the church? I'm afraid of commitment. Why are you so irritable all the time? I'm afraid nobody cares about me. Why do you stay so busy? I'm I'm afraid of slowing down. Fred Craddock said, afraid, 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 afraid. That's the refrain of what we are and what we do, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to live and love and laugh. Don't be afraid to give and serve and care. Don't be afraid to speak and do. That's the message of Christ. Don't be afraid, for he said, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age. You see, fear will suck the quality out of our lives, but only if we let it. Fear will absolutely paralyze us, but only if we let it. Fear will keep us worried about everything under the sun, but only if we let it. So let's make a commitment as we begin this Lenten season to follow the one who lived a fearless life and to pray and ask God for the courage to do the same. And we just might be surprised that God will give us that strength when we least expect it. And we can learn to live our lives joyfully, gratefully, and lovingly, and not in a spirit of fear. Amen.